This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. The Almighty explicitly states that we are not to add nor subtract from His Word. So, when someone suggests that a verse doesn't belong in the Bible, as believers, we get upset. But what if taking a verse out is not really taking it out? What if it's actually correcting an addition that was made hundreds of years ago? And what if that correction could actually help people understand the Bible, our responsibilities as believers, and the entire Bible better than ever? Well, you're about to find out because it's the end of the sixth day. The sun is set and this is Shabbat Night Live. Well, Shabbat Shalom, Torah fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. Man, does this issue have some people upset? John 6, 4. Maybe you don't even know the controversy surrounding this one seemingly insignificant verse in the Bible, but you're going to know a lot more about it tonight. We'll talk more with Michael Rood about this in just a second. But first, we have a brand new love gift to tell you about. Going to be real quick about this because we want to get to Michael. But essentially, we're doing uh, three levels to our love gift again uh, this month, as we did in July. And this month, I don't know if you can see this on screen, but boy, this is beautiful. It's a necklace, st a solid sterling silver necklace with the name of Yehovah encrusted with diamonds. Very beautiful. If you want to see it and all the details, go to monthlylovegift.com. Now, let's talk about this uh, new series about John 6-4 with my co-host, the founder of Arud Awakening International. Please welcome Michael Rood. Thank you, Scott. Yes, sir. Good to be with you here. Yeah. So John 6-4, man. Uh, I, I'm very excited about this series. This is groundbreaking. I, I have it uh, with us here. Uh, this is the first edition, the very first edition of the Nestle Allen Critical Greek Text. This was uh, uh, printed in Stuttgart, Germany, the year I was born, 1952. Okay. And it took me 30 years before I could read it <laughs> uh, because it's uh, because it's in Greek. But uh, in this uh, particular book, it details a verse that was added to the Bible. A verse that was added, and uh, it was added by those who did not realize that the Gospels are based on the commandment in the Torah, that every male in Israel must go up to Jerusalem three times a year. It's an absolute requirement, and that the Gospels show Yeshua going up to each one of the feasts of the Lord. But what happened is that those who didn't understand the feast of the Lord, because raised in the Christian world, we basically know nothing mm. about the feast of the Lord. We know a lot about Christmas, Easter, and Halloween, but not the feast of the Lord. And so they inadvertently, or uh, sometimes we think maybe even deliberately, added this verse into later Greek text uh, in order to artificially lengthen his ministry to fit with their theology. And so uh, this is something that uh, I was awakened to and it took me more than 20 years to ferret this out, but when I realized that this verse was added to the scripture, and this is what confused the entire chronology of the gospel record, then I knew that we had something. And John Lorquette and Nehemia Gordon are the ones that really uh, took this to a whole new level, and I am so excited about what they shared with us uh, at uh, the Passover celebration that we did and what we're doing now. This is absolutely essential for every believer to understand because if that, that those words are allowed to stand, your entire Bible falls apart. Right, because without the feast and the chronology, uh, Yeshua's ministry is, like you said, artificially lengthened to three and a half years instead of the 70 weeks that it really was. And then, it, it, uh, so let's say you go back to that three and a half years, now Yeshua's birth, death, resurrection, and second coming don't line up at the feasts. Uh, the chronology right. doesn't work, and he doesn't anything. And, and they don't work anything. with history either, right? Scott. It, yeah. it just, it doesn't work with anything that we've been given uh, through the system uh, of error that has been promulgated because the feast have been ignored. 
Yeah, and this is not a new argument either. I mean, you have a document oh, from the 1600s that- This is, uh, uh, Nehemiah gave me this book. It, it took him months to get this out of, uh, out of Europe. Uh -huh. and this is a, a 1643 in Amsterdam. Of course, this is in Latin, but in Amsterdam, uh, this was published and it is a beautiful book, uh, 1643, ancient book, and it details that very issue back wow. then. They were aware of it, that that verse did not work in the Bible. And so, uh, you know, that, that's what scholars understood. And these are the, the ones that are writing this in, in Latin. It's a beautiful book. I appreciate not only what Nehemiah did in giving this, but in him getting involved in this very thing. Because Nehemiah and John, they've done something way beyond my pay grade, and that's why we have them on the program. All right, well, not to, uh, not to give away all, all the surprises, so we're gonna get oh, right yeah. to it. Thank you for joining us, Michael. Okay, so we're gonna get to it right now. This is John 6, 4, Does It Belong in Your Bible? with uh, Michael Rood and Nehemiah Gordon and John Lorquette. And if you appreciate seeing this on Shabbat Night Live, uh, we need your assistance. And the best way to do that is with our love gift program. Here's how to get it. Have you ever felt like God had called you to do something special, but roadblocks and limitations stopped you from accomplishing the goal? Sometimes those limitations are put in place by the Almighty Himself to help you develop your faith and patience as you wait for Him to lead the way. The early disciples encountered these same limitations, as Michael Rood explains in this month's Love Gift teaching, Growing Through Limitation. Sometimes it can happen with the circumstances that I said, that Satan is not smart enough and now you're fighting against God because he is blocking you. Other times it's the Holy Spirit saying, no, there's something wrong here. Don't get in this ship. Don't go do this, what you are attempting to do. Growing Through Limitation is not available for sale, and it's not on YouTube, but you can own it in August for a love gift donation of just $50, or donate $100 or more to receive Growing Through Limitation, plus artwork of the Second Temple, printed on a stone plaque display. Or as a special bonus, only in August, you can receive Growing Through Limitation, the Second Temple stone plaque, and a custom-made sterling silver pendant necklace featuring the name of God from the Aleppo Codex, all for a gift of $300 or more. This breathtaking necklace and pendant is solid sterling silver, and the vowel points in the name of God are flush set with real diamonds, a fitting tribute to the name above all names. Limited quantities are available, so act now. You'll get Michael Rood's exclusive love gift teaching, Growing Through Limitation, for a love gift donation of $50 the teaching and the Second Temple stone plaque for a love gift of $100 or more, or get everything plus the Name of God diamond necklace for a love gift donation of $300 or more. These gifts are a limited quantity, one-time offer to thank you for your support of A Rude Awakening International. Make your love gift donation now to receive these special gifts. Call now or visit monthlylovegift.com. Traditions that we inherited from Babylon through Constantine have us occasionally with a little plastic cup and a little round wafer in a church service having what is called communion. But Yeshua was not having communion with his disciples. It was the last meal before his crucifixion, which happened at the time the Passover lambs were being sacrificed the following morning. Yeshua took this opportunity to explain something that had been embedded in the, the Israelite culture for then over a thousand years. Melchizedek brought forth bread and wine to Abraham and he blessed the Most High saying, Baruch Atah Yehovah, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Hamotzi Lechem Min HaAretz. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Yeshua said, this represents my body which will be broken for you. As often as you do it, you do it in remembrance of me. And so we break this bread and we do it in remembrance of him. Likewise, Yeshua took the cup and he blessed the most high with that blessing that Melchizedek blessed the most high. Baruch Atah Yehovah. Eloheinu melech ha'olam, borei pari hagafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, the king of the universe, 
the creator of the fruit of the vine. Yeshua said, this represents my shed blood, which will be poured out for the remission of sin. I will not drink another drop of the fruit of the vine. You take my cup and divide it among yourselves because I won't drink it until I drink it again with you in my Father's kingdom. The marriage supper of the Lamb, Yeshua will lift this cup and he will say, Lahaim to life everlasting. And until then, we remember what he's done and remember that marriage supper of the Lamb. Get ready. Uh, I, I became aware of some of the things that uh, Nehemia is going to be sharing, and we have a, a special guest with us that he's going to be introduced in a moment. But uh, it was uh, this last year, I was not able to, to go over to Jerusalem. Uh, Nehemia was there for several months, and when he got back, uh, I called him up and he started to uh, tell me about some of the work that he had been doing. And I was very excited about this and knew that, uh, uh, and I, I, I thought right then, I'd love to have them at Passover. And uh, because for everyone to, to be able to participate in this. And then as we got to talking and he, he came and visited in December, uh, that is when I realized that there's not gonna be room for anyone else. If, I just, if we just talk about what we did, uh, what we talked about uh, you know, in private uh, for a few hours that night, there was gonna be no way to jam this all in. And so I'm going to now turn it over to Nehemia, and he's going to take off on. And he's touched on some of this in, on Shabbat Night Live recently. But to put it all in context, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Nehemia Gordon. I, I am so excited about what we're going to be sharing today. This is something I've been working on for many months. Uh, it really all started a number of months back. I was sitting with this gentleman, and he was, he was really rebuking me. He said, how can you have all these interactions with Michael Rood? He said, Michael Rood is leading people astray. And I said, how is Michael leading people astray? T uh, give me specifics. And it was a bit ironic, because this man was a, a messianic believer. And I said, you have more in common with Michael than you do with me. <laughs> <laughs> so how is it that Michael's leading people astray? And he, and he was you know, looking for different things. And finally he said, it's John 6, 4. Michael tells people that John 6, 4 should not be in the Bible. He's removing a verse from the Bible. How dare he do that? And I listened to what the man had to say, and he wasn't the first one to bring this up. I'd heard this from quite a number of people. And I realized they keep bringing up this one verse. And, and to me it was a little bit strange because I'm not a Messianic Jew, I'm not a Christian. This is one verse... You know, if somebody came to me and said, hey, Deuteronomy 6.4, the Shema, doesn't belong in your Torah, I'd be like, that's a non-starter. <laughs> but if it was Genesis 10, you know, 26 or something, okay, we could have that conversation. Show me a manuscript where that's missing and we can talk about that, right? Um, so so I, I didn't, I'll be honest, I didn't fully understand, and Micah's going to explain why John 6.4 is, is so central, but it was difficult for me to fully grasp it but as he was explaining this to me, I said to him, you know what, I'm going to look into this. And if I find out there's no evidence to support what Michael is saying, I will sit down with Michael myself and, and, and I, will, I will correct him and tell him, you cannot be teaching this. <laughs> I'll say, look, Michael, there's no evidence for what you're saying. You can't be teaching this in John 6, 4. Yeah. So the next morning, I sat down with breakfast with my friend here, John Lorquette, and we were with a third gentleman. And I said to John, I told everybody what had happened and how I'd heard, I've had this conversation many times, it wasn't the first time. And I said, um, I explained what happened and there was another man sitting there at breakfast and he piped up, he said, John 6, 4, Michael is wrong about John 6, 4 and I can demonstrate it. I said, okay, now we're making progress. What is the demonstration, what's the proof? He said, I asked this manuscript expert and he told me Michael was wrong. I said, well, that's just someone's expert opinion, and they may be right. It really was a big expert. I said, but I need to look into this myself. I can read manuscripts. And I asked John here, I said, would you help me look at John 6, 4 uh, and find out, is there evidence to support what Michael's saying? And I can't prove if Michael's right or wrong, 
right? That, that's ultimately something you, each one of you hearing this, needs to decide based on the evidence. But what I could do, and this is what my expertise is, is to look and see, is there evidence to support his position? Or is this just something, some harebrained theory he just plucked out of the air because he didn't like a certain verse and decided to remove it from the Bible, right? And there's a really big difference between those two things. What I didn't know at the time is my friend John here had already spent 40 hours studying this very question, and he has done hundreds of hours of research. This has been an international effort where I've been involved, John Lorquette's been involved, T-Bone. T-Bone is, is this godsend who has been sent to us to look through Hebrew and now Greek manuscripts to study things that it would take me a lifetime to do. He does it in three days. Can we give a shout out to T-Bone? T-Bone, T-Bone, T-Bone. Yes. <laughs> we have a gentleman in, uh, in uh, Greece who's been helping us with this project, uh, Dr. Pavlos Vasiliadis, who we would find something and, and I would see this and I'm like, I don't know, this can't be right. I can't believe what I'm seeing here and I send it to the Greek expert to verify and in some instances he sends it on to other Greek experts. The top people in Greece have been working on this problem. Uh, uh, top paleographers in the world have been helping us with this. We've been talking to the head of the Nestle Allen Project, all kinds of top experts we've been consulting, because I wanted to know, is there evidence to support this or not? Uh, and again, I can't in the end say you should believe this, or agree with what Michael's saying or not. What I can do is prevent, present you with the evidence and you decide for yourself. So we're sitting there at breakfast and the man says, I can demonstrate it, and I say, challenge accepted. I've spent many endless, uh, uh, you know, uh, sleepless nights ever since working on this project, sometimes 16, 18 hours a day, because I wanted to get an answer. Um, now, before we get to John 6.4, I hate to do this, because I want to talk about that, but before we get to John 6.4, the gravity of this situation is so great that I want to look at a different verse and talk about that, I want to talk about something in the book of Acts, because we're talking about a really big deal here. We're talking about what many people, over a billion people in the world, consider this to be the word of God, and Michael's coming along and saying this should be removed from their Bible. That is not a small thing. You don't take that lightly. That's a very big deal. And I, as a Jew, I take that very seriously. Again, it's like if it was you know, Genesis 10, 29 or something, that would, every letter there is the word of God to me. So if you're, even if it's some minor verse, the days of so-and-so were so, so many, okay, but that's still important. So we have to take this very seriously. And so before we get to John 6, 4, which we will get to, I want to look at Acts chapter 21, verse 25. And that's actually something that John here brought up with me. Um, and John, tell us the story of how Acts 21, 25 came into this conversation. So I'm having a conversation with, uh, with a friend of mine, and we have slightly different views on how believers in the Messiah should live. Uh, I believe that the Torah is applicable when, when Yeshua says that uh, we should not live by bread alone, but by every word that God spoke. And my friend has a slightly different view. He believes that uh, believers in the Messiah only need to worry about the Ten Commandments, only the Ten Commandments. And uh, we're having this discussion, and, and he's very passionate and, and observes the Sabbath. It's one of the Ten Commandments. And we're discussing some of the things beyond the Ten Commandments. And he says, uh, I need you to show me in the Scriptures uh, a passage that, that shows that beyond the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah, that believers in the Messiah were following the Ten Commandments. So we go to Acts 21, which is a story where uh, Paul comes to James and James, they're discussing what's been done in the ministry. And James says, here we have all these believers in the Messiah who are zealous for the Torah. And, but there's this rumor about you, Paul, that you're teaching these things. Uh, and I'm going to read you exactly what it says. They've been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise your children or walk according to our customs. And, and this is, in James's mind, this is a false rumor because he keeps us, we've got to do something about this. We have to do, and I'm going to read exactly what it says here. Let, let me just jump in here. It's a false rumor to James, but to many Christians, it's actually true today. 
Am I right? A lot of Christian doctrine comes from false accusations that are levied against Paul, unfortunately. <laughs> it's ironic. James says, what then is to be done? They'll certainly hear that you've come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so they may shave their heads. Thus, all will know that there is nothing in what they've been told about you. Mm -hmm. So James' whole purpose here is we've got to show them there's nothing true about what's being said. In other words, that Paul actually is upholding the Torah, mm -hmm. according here to this uh, account, and he's got to demonstrate that to the people by participating in this ritual sacrifice, this ritual uh, in the temple, and this is after, the re uh, according you know, to the Gospels, the death and resurrection of Yeshua, which according to some people today, the Torah was done away with. That. It, it, when he said it is finished, that was the end of the Torah. That's what some people believe. That's John Chrysostom, we're going to see later, says that. Yes. So we're, at this point, we're in agreement about what's going on. However, uh, the next verse, he's reading from King James Bible, and I'm reading from ESV Bible. And I'm going to read it in the King James Version, which is the version he's reading. I read my version, and he stops me. He says, hold on a second. You've got to stop. Read that again. And I read it again, and then he reads me his version. I'm going to read King James Version here. Uh, they say, take them and purify them and be at char charges with them that they may shave their heads and all may know those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing but that thou thyself also walkest orderly, keeping the law. As touching Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing. Wow. Mm. Yeah, guys, I, I, I just, I'm going to read that again because that's just so powerful. Did you read the ESV there yet? Or could you read us how it's different? The ESV reads differently. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the ESV reads, switch versions here. Right, right yeah, there on, yeah. on the screen, yeah. you can see that. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed from idols and from blood and what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. Wow, okay, so there's a fundamental difference. I don't know if you guys caught that. We're going to go back over it again. But I want, I want to bring you here first to um, uh, what he says in Acts 15, because he's alluding back or, or referring back to something which actually first happened in, in the book of Acts, where there were people came, coming to, uh, you know, to the early, what's called the early church, and saying these Gentiles can't be saved unless they follow these laws, these Pharisee laws, so it seems. Right, you had Pharisees who became believers. That's that, right. That. Um, and so in verse uh, Acts 15... Let's see, it's uh, verse 20. He said, you should write to them to abstain from the things polluted to I by idols. In, in other words, in Acts 21, it's just reiterating what he already had said. Things polluted by idols and from sexual morality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moshe has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. In other words, the discussion here in the book of Acts, originally in what's called the Jerusalem Council, is we have these people who aren't Jews, and we have to decide, can we even let them into the synagogue? Are they even allowed to step foot in the synagogue to be part of what's called at that time this body of believers? And the Pharisees say, no, not unless they're circumcised and stand before a panel of rabbis. Then if they want to believe in Yeshua, great. Otherwise, they can't even step foot in. And what James decides is, no, there's four things we need to get them started. These are the four essential things. And then the rest they'll hear every week in the synagogue. And to me, the analogy here is to Abraham. And, and look, I stole this from Paul. Paul of Tarsus, he says this, right? That Abraham had this covenant with God. And he came into the land when he was 75 years old. But he walked around for decades uncircumcised, walking with the Creator, it wasn't until he was 99 years old that God told him, okay, now it's time to be circumcised. And I think this is what Paul was teaching, and certainly what it seems from James is, look, you know, circumcision for an adult is no small matter. Even today, in Israel, for example, can only be done in a hospital. Yeah. Uh, it's a very serious thing. And so the point here is, yes, they can come in the synagogue and they'll hear the Torah, and as they're led, that's what they'll, they'll be led to do and keep. But don't keep them out. Don't bar them from joining just because they're uncircumcised. You know, they weren't circumcised. It's easy for me to say get circumcised. It happened when I was eight days old, right? Don't remember it. Uh, well, I remember a little bit, but anyway. Um, <laughs> so uh, my mother, well, anyway, we won't talk about that. <laughs> so 
<laughs> Let's go back to the book of Acts, chapter 21, verse 25. But as, and this is the ESV, as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from these four things. But in the King James Version that John is reading with his friend, there's eight extra words. In the Greek, it's six words. In the English, it's eight extra words. As touching the Gentiles, meaning concerning the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded, James says, that they observe no such thing, referring to the Torah that, Moses, that, uh, that Paul is demonstrating that he's keeping. That's only for Paul the Jew, according to the King James. It's not for the Gentiles. The only thing they need to keep is these four basic things. So, so the Gentiles are allowed to uh, steal, according to this. The Gentiles are allowed to murder. They just can't drink blood. The Gentiles are allowed to do all kinds of things, just not these four things, uh, according to the way that this could be read in the King James. So you're having this conversation, John, with your friend, and he's got his version, and you've got your version, and what do you do? How do you convince him? Do you convince him? I can't say that I did. Okay. <laughs> the Why first, wasn't he the first thing that I did is I pulled up some textual commentaries, and immediately they all say the exact same thing, that this is in a, a, a certain manuscripts, it's not in others. The conclusion, the general conclusion is that this text does not belong in the scriptures. And, and the fundamental problem we have, and this is not a unique problem between me and my friend, anybody that's ever sat down at a table with more than three or four people, you're reading different versions of the Bible. Mm-hmm. The, they don't always read exactly the same way. And uh, in this particular instance, uh, I, I asked him, I said, we've got to be willing to go beyond the text that we have here on our English pages, and we need to do a study here, and we need to determine what the original language of the Bible is. We have a variant here, and we have to get beyond this. Um, the textual commentaries, there's manuscript images that we can go through. We've got a lot of material here we can look at, and there's a very clear conclusion that this text doesn't belong. Can we look at the versions where this appears? Because you, you guys have to understand, a lot of times when you're looking at different uh, Bible translations, they'll translate the same thing differently. Here, they're not translating the same thing differently. There's extra words. That's a, that's a very different kind of problem. So uh, we actually have here a list that John put together of these eight words that they should observe no such thing except, right? Those are very key words because that thing there is the Torah, right? This is a direct... Co- uh, instruction from James, don't keep the Torah in the King James. So, so what are the different versions, John, tell us that you found? Well, it, it does not appear in the Net Bible, uh, the ESV Bible, RSV. Most of the modern Bibles don't have it. The only Bibles that contain it are Bibles that are based on uh, Textus Receptus, mm-hmm. like the King James 1611, and those Bibles that came from that that similar source. So, so tell people, what is this Textus Receptus? Because that sounds very authoritative, right? It's the received text. It's the one that uh, Paul himself or, or whoever, right? It's one of the, it's certainly that came from the apostles, right? Not exactly. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So what is the Textus we, Receptus? We, we, don't, we don't have the original manuscripts that the apostles wrote. We don't have the original gospels that the gospel authors wrote. We have copies of copies of copies and uh, there's 5,800 approximately, uh, finding more every day, 5,800 copies of New Testament manuscripts. However, those copies don't always agree with one another. So somebody has to uh, look at these copies where they vary and decisions have to be made. Are we gonna use this, this version of the text or that version of the text? And this, this instance here in Acts just happens to be one of those locations where one text reads one way and another text, many other texts read another way. Now, you mentioned to me something about this verse I thought was really interesting, that as far as you know, this is the only direct place in the New Testament where it tells you not to keep the Torah. Not only that, but this is plain, simple language. Our Father is not going to make us guess what the commandments are. We don't have to interpret an allegory to find out, thou shalt not commit adultery. If he doesn't want us committing adultery, he just says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Straightforward. We should not have to go through elaborate interpretations of... uh, uh, you know, Paul, Peter says that Paul's hard to understand. We should not have to go through allegories in Paul to determine how we're supposed to behave. Conduct, commandments are done in plain, simple language. And here in the King James Bible, we have plain, simple language indicating Don't keep that the, the Gentiles should not observe no such thing. No such thing. So this so. is a huge uh, issue because it, this has ramifications. There's many textual variants, and most textual variants 
are on things that, that have no uh, bearing on your walk or conduct to your faith. Right. But in this case, one version tells us that we should not obey the Torah, and without it, this story in Acts 21 is the clearest example in the New Testament of believers after the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah who are zealous for the Torah and keeping the Torah. Every episode of the teaching program that you are watching is broadcast in many nations around the world. It is translated into several different languages. And it is not monetized on YouTube or any other way. It is only monetized by those whose lives are helped, their lives are changed, and they give to this ministry. We depend upon you for the continuation of this ministry. This ministry does not exist without miracles happening. And if a miracle has happened in your life, if your eyes have been opened, if you've turned from darkness to light, if you've been delivered from the bondage of religion into the glorious light of the gospel of the kingdom of Yeshua, our Messiah, then we're asking you to take this time right now and to give. Give to this ministry so that we can continue doing what we have been doing for all these decades, and that is preaching a pure gospel of the kingdom. It all depends upon you. We need your help. We need it now. Now, now, guys, I want to jump over to something from the Tanakh, okay? Because I'm coming from a Tanakh Old Testament perspective. When I read the Tanakh, we also have what are called textual variants. So what, do we mean, what do we mean by that? So we do not have the original copy of the Torah that Joshua wrote on the tablets of stone that were covered with plaster. It's described in the book of Joshua. Uh, we don't have the original Torah that Moses completed that, wrote, that he wrote. We have copies of copies of copies of copies. And, there, and what we do is we look at different manuscripts and we compare them and we try to find out what did the original say. Now, sometimes the, the differences are very minor. For example, in Exodus 15, there's a famous example where it says, Mikdash Adonai Konanu Yadecha, the uh, sanctuary of the Lord your hands have established. And in some manuscripts, instead of Lord, it says Yehovah. Well, that's kind of important. However, let's be honest, Adonai and Yehovah is the same deity, is the same God, doesn't really change the message. What we have here in the, between the King James Version and other translations is something that fundamentally changes the message. Do no such thing is a very significant difference. And what I love about this example is nobody, other than the King James only people, nobody disputes that these six words in Greek, eight words in English were added. However, what's interesting is they were added in a relatively early period. You can see here we have a codex, a famous, important document. Codex Bezai, it dates to the 5th century AD, and it has those six words. And I love what John did here. He went through numerous manuscripts looking, are they in there, are they not in there? Are they in there, are they not in there? He basically taught himself Greek so he could read and identify these words in the manuscript. Codex Bezai, the six words are included. It says, do no such thing in the 5th century. That's very early. Ephraimi Rescriptus is a really interesting codex. Uh, it's what's called a palimpsest. A palimpsest means it was recycled. They took the original gospel, they washed off the words, and they wrote a different text on top of it. What scholars in the 19th century did is they went through this thing with a microscope and took special types of photographs, and they were able to read the erased words. And what we have marked here in this 5th century the original text of the palimpsest, it has the six words in Greek, do no such thing. So two witnesses, and we can say, hey, there's, everything is established by two or three witnesses. But what do you do when you have two witnesses that say the other way around? Here's Codex Sinaiticus from the fourth century. And when we've marked there in red, that's where the words do not appear. If the words were in the text, this is where they would be. And they're not in the fourth century Codex Sinaiticus. Codex Vaticanus, 4th century, the words are omitted. Where we put in red here is where those words would appear. So we have two different versions. And, and John, what I love about the story you told is at the end, the way you described it to me, is we had two, you and your friend were on the phone and you said, you have your Bible and I have my Bible and they're not, and they're not the same. In one they appear and the other they don't. Here's Codex Alexandrinus from the 5th century, the words are omitted. Uh, P74 is a papyrus, and you think a papyrus must be early. Not necessarily. This one's later than the codexes. Uh, it's from the 7th century. The words are omitted. So 
Here's a quote from uh, two of the greatest uh, New Testament scholars who wrote a book called The Textual Guide to the Greek New Testament, Omanson and Metzger. Bruce Metzger is a legend in New Testament textual uh, studies. They write, the reading, meaning those six words, eight words in the English, do no such thing, is a Western paraphrase of the intent of the decree of James. And, and this is really interesting. These guys know that you're not supposed to keep the Torah. That's their starting assumption. And if those six words were inserted into the text, which they agree, those words were added, that they're paraphrasing what James' original intent. Here's what James meant to say, even though he didn't say it. So some writer in the West, the Western part of the Roman Empire, this Western paraphrase added these six words, eight words in English, six words in Greek, to tell you this is what, lest somebody read it and think you don't have to keep the Torah, or sorry, lest somebody read it and think that you are supposed to keep the Torah, they added these words to make it clear, do no such thing. And what's beautiful about this example is this is not a problem of translation. It's a problem of which manuscript do we rely on. It's not that the translators of the NRSV took six words out of the Bible. They just based it on a different manuscript. And if Michael could come along and say, hey, it's not that I'm taking John 6, 4 out of the Bible, but I'm relying on a manuscript then I think we can have a conversation. If he's just removing words from your Bible, well, you can take anything out of the Bible then. Any verse you don't like, just pluck it out. But if he has an actual text, then we can have a serious conversation. Does that make any sense? I, I hope it does. Um, so we've got these six words that are added. With that said, now I want to get to John 6, 4 and see what we have. What is the evidence? Because there's got to be a text. There's got to be evidence in a manuscript, in a document somewhere. It can't just be, I don't like that verse. It doesn't fit my theory. That's not acceptable. And as Christian believers, we have to be willing to go beyond the version that we have before us. Well, yeah. tell us how it ended with your friend. Unfortunately, we, we never saw eye to eye. I, I asked him, I said, well, your version says this, my version says that. Let's look into the text. Uh, his response was, I don't need to. I said, well, one of these versions is inspired and one of these versions isn't. Which one is the inspired text? And he says, well, the King James. I says, okay, well, the King James was revised several times the first year it was printed. And we and, actually uh, went together to the Museum of the Bible. Tell them about that. I happen that. to have a photo awesome. on my phone from the King James exhibit, which has many different uh, printings of the King James Bible. And the banner above reads, 150 years of revision. <laughs> so I sent him a photo from the Museum of the Bible. <laughs> when it ended, uh, the answer was the version that's in my hand. Mm. Wow. Wow. There was even in the exhibit, there's a version of the King James Bible that was printed. It's known as the Wicked Bible. It was a misprint, but it was printed to say, thou shall commit adultery. Yeah. Thank God he didn't have that version in his hand. No. <laughs> I must get this version. How do I get it? <laughs> now, Nehemia, you were at the museum yeah, uh, yeah. of the Bible. You handled scrolls that were hundreds and hundreds of years oh, yeah. old from all over the world. Yeah, the Museum uh, of the Bible actually has the most important collection in the world, the largest collection in the world of Torah scrolls. And they let me there into the, uh, into the vaults. Uh, together with John, to examine some of these manuscripts for look, looking at the same, the same type of thing we're talking about in the New Testament, we were looking at in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh, looking at these different Torah scrolls and comparing differences. There's no two manuscripts of any book that's ever been written that are identical. And, you know, when people study the writings of Julius Caesar, that Julius Caesar invaded Britain and he crossed the Rubicon, we're looking at manuscripts, and no two manuscripts are identical. Now, you might think, oh, well, we know exactly what happened in ancient Rome based on the documents describing Julius Caesar. We actually know a lot less about what happened with Julius Caesar than we do uh, when it comes to the New Testament. Um, in fact, the, the documentation of the New Testament has been described as the best documented book from the ancient world. There are more witnesses to that than almost any, I think, than any other book in existence. Um, maybe even more than the Tanakh, because I think there's more manuscripts. And, and, the reason, and the reason these are so important is what happened is, you know, today when we go to pr pr print a book, we create a PDF, and they produce identical copies of that PDF. 
What they did in ancient times is Paul would le- send a letter to the Thessalonians. And then somebody would come and visit the Thessalonians and copy that letter. And they'd bring it back to, let's say, Corinth. And then somebody would visit Corinth and they'd say, hey, that's a cool letter you got from Paul. And they would copy that. And this is how these books were disseminated throughout the Christian world. And because of that, sometimes errors were reproduced, but then sometimes also the correct version was reproduced. And sometimes you'll look at the thousands of manuscripts and you'll find the error is in the thousands and it's only a small number that have the correct reading. And that is actually the example with Acts 21-25. Those six words that were added that everyone, except for the King James only people agree, were added. Every scholar in the world agrees those words were added. Every serious scholar. Those six words appear in the vast majority of New Testament manuscripts. They're in what's called the Byzantine majority text. If you took the statistics, you would find a very high percentage have those added words and only a relatively small number, in this case of early manuscripts, have the original reading where those words are not included, where they're omitted. So you can't just follow the majority of manuscripts and you can't always follow, as we'll see, the earliest manuscripts. You have to look at the evidence and see what support there is for something. And that's what we're going to do with John 6, 4. And the last thing I want is for somebody to walk out of here and say, well, I can't trust my Bible anymore. In fact, what my takeaway from this, from doing this study, is that the documentation for the New Testament is astounding. When you compare this to any other ancient document, we have more evidence for this to support the reading in the Greek than any... And I actually had this conversation with John. I said, look, when I taught about the Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus, one of the things I said was, don't throw away your Greek text. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying here is the Hebrew is another witness to what the original read, but the Greek is still the primary text. And John said to me something really funny. He said, what do you mean I watched your video? You said, you said we should get rid of our Greek text. No, you, no, no, no. I no, didn't say no, that. What did you say? But I had no recollection of you saying that. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> okay. And you I pulled had, your book out and you're like, it's I had here in show, my book. <laughs> I had a show where I literally like, directly said that because still the Greek is the primary witness and it cannot be discounted. Now, with all that, let's get to John 6, 4. John 6, 4, and here I'm going to just... Uh, I'm going to pass it off to Michael because, Michael, you know, to me, the question has to be asked before we even get to the evidence, uh, the actual uh, uh, documentary evidence, what makes you think John 6, 4 shouldn't be in the Gospels in the first place? Well, that's an excellent question, and I would like to bring us up to the chart. Okay, now, this chart right up here, of course you can't see it all, but I'm going to illustrate something on this right here that is very important. This is the day that Yeshua is baptized. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all cover uh, or speak about the 40 days that he is in the wilderness. Then the temptation, and this is also the day that the Pharisees send Levites and Kohanim down to ask John, are you the Messiah? Are you the prophet? On that very same day. Then the next day, Yeshua comes out of the wilderness, and this is the Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke stop with, with the, the 40 days of the temptation. Then John picks up and shows Yeshua going up to the feast of Passover. Then after Passover, he stays in the, the, uh, uh, the area of Jerusalem and baptizes. Then John chapter 4, verse 1, when Yeshua finds out that the Pharisees now know that he's making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Yeshua baptizes not, only his disciples baptize, it is at that point when he's gaining popularity that he leaves Jerusalem, goes up into the Galilee, and half, uh, 18 hours north of Jerusalem, It's the woman at the well. He stays with the Samaritans two days and then goes back to Canaan where he had turned the water to wine before Passover. And then he does not have time to go minister to this wealthy man whose son is dying. He says, go your way, your son is healed. The man finds out the next day on his way back that his son has been healed. And Yeshua is then up in Jerusalem just a few days later on Friday and then the Sabbath, That's the day he heals a man who was lame for 38 years. On the Sabbath, the day before, Shavuot. On Shavuot, the next day, there's a multitude on the Temple Mount, and this is when it says the Pharisees are making plans to kill him because he just healed a man on the Sabbath day and then told the man to to 
pick up his bed and walk, which is breaking Pharisee law. And it says, Yeshua is on the Temple Mount, and he said, John was a burning and shining light. You were willing to rejoice in his light for a season. It is that at that point that Yeshua knows that John, while he was in the Galilee, Yeshua was in the Galilee, John has been put in prison. And now Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us that when Yeshua finds out that John's been put in prison, he departs in the Galilee and begins to teach in the synagogue. And this is, this is him teaching the synagogue. The first one was Nazareth where he read the prophecy of Isaiah, the acceptable year of the Lord. It's at the end of the week, because it's on the Sabbath, it's on the seventh day, the first day of the week was Shavuot. This begins the acceptable year of the Lord. This is from his ministry, the acceptable year of the Lord, from one Shavuot to the Shavuot year, Pentecost, when he baptizes his followers with the Holy Spirit. And so we have, this, this is John uh, covering all the way up to Shavuot, then Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is the training of the disciples, sending the, the apostles out in the sixth month, and then regathering. And when he regathers them in the Galilee, they all come together and they're bringing a multitude with them. This is when Yeshua feeds a multitude of 5,000 plus women and children. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the one and only miracle covered by all four gospel authors. This gives us a moment in time, a moment in which all four gospels can be synchronized with absolutely no error and you go both ways and everything fits. There's not a day missing. There's not a week. There's not an issue that's missing in all of the gospel records of Yeshua's ministry, a 70-week ministry, 490 days from the day he's baptized to the day he baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And already you're, you're, you're putting things together in your brain about uh, the book of Daniel and all, but literally 70 weeks. After the 62nd week, after 62 weeks, the 63rd week, that one week he's cut off in the midst of the week. After three days and three nights in the grave, he's raised from uh, the dead on the Sabbath. And then the next day or at sunset is the day of first fruits, and we count seven from there, seven Sabbaths. So we got 62 sevens. We got after 62 sevens, we got one seven. We got in the midst of seven, and then we got the seven Sabbaths that count us and bring us all the way to the finishing of Yeshua's ministry, which is the baptizing of the, his followers on the day of Shavuot. Now, we've got a problem. John 6, 4 is among those four gospels that record the feeding of the 5,000. But words were added, and Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. That's the, that, that is the key. Ladies and gentlemen, I tried for 20 years to make the gospel record fit, and I could not make it fit. And the last thing I wanted to do is take out a verse from the Bible. But if those words, if Passover, a feast of the Jews, is nigh, and it's the end of the sixth month, John 6, 4 is Passover, but John 7 is, the, is uh, tabernacles, Wait, we've got a whole half year of blank space to get to a Passover that Yeshua never goes up to. And then you've got another half year to go, a blank space to get back to the Feast of Tabernacles that he does go to. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have, have tabernacles right after the feeding of the 5,000. But what does, uh, what does uh, the Passover Feast of the Jews add in? a whole year of blank space, and that is the whole motivation. And we're, well, I'm not gonna say what the motivation is because we're gonna let the early church fathers and what John has found out, we're gonna let him tell you why they did this, okay? Excellent, wonderful. That's it. All right, Michael, so we can understand, uh, and, I, and I call this that, you know, your explanation of John 6, 4 being added provides, uh, or it has what's called explanatory scope. If you remove John 6, 4, then the gospel chronology makes a lot more sense in the way you've explained it. Uh, and as I said in the beginning, I can't say whether John 6, 4 is added or not. What I can do is provide you the evidence. What's interesting to me is Eusebius, who is known, and we'll bring the quote later, of how Eusebius believes in a three-and-a-half-year ministry. Even Eusebius admits that Matthew, Mark, and Luke record a one-year period. 
Here's what Eusebius writes in his church history. Eusebius lived in the fourth century. He was the court historian of Constantine. Uh, he writes, For it is evident that the three evangelists, meaning Matthew, Mark, and Luke, recorded only the deeds done by the Savior for one year after the imprisonment of John the Baptist and indicated this is the beginning of their account. And what that means is that the other two and a half years of Eusebius' uh, reckoning of the ministry has to be before the imprisonment of John, of John the Baptist. And we'll see that later. Let, let's get a quick overview of the feasts. There are six feasts mentioned in the Gospel of John. These are John 2 the, is a Passover when Yeshua is baptized. John 5 is the unnamed feast. We're going to keep talking about the unnamed feast, the unnamed feast. That's John 5. It says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews. It doesn't say the name of the feast. According to Michael's chronology, that is Shavuot. Shavuot. And we'll talk about that later. Uh, John 6, 4 is a Passover. John 7 is tabernacles. John 10 is uh, Hanukkah, dedication. And John 13 is the final Passover, of course. And if you don't have John 6, 4 in that mix, then you end up with the cycle exactly like the other three Gospels of a year. You have the exact cycles, Passover, Shavuot, uh, Sukkot, Hanukkah, and then another Passover ending that year. And John 6, 4 is kind of thrown into this mix, uh, breaking that uh, cycle. And it isn't just Michael who said, hey, something's not right here. There have been scholars for 400 years at least who have been saying this as well. Before we get to them, I want to bring a church father. The church fathers were these early Christian authors. We'll explain more in a little bit. But this is a man named John Chrysostom, and he really hated the Jews. He particularly hated that there were Christians in his day who went to Jewish synagogues and were what he saw as Judaizing. That really burned him the wrong way. <laughs> So he says, he's commenting on John 6, 4, and he's dealing with the question, what on earth is Yeshua doing in the Galilee heading north when it's Passover and he should be heading south to Jerusalem? It makes no sense even to John Chrysostom who hates Jews and hates the Torah. Here's what he says. How then, saith someone, does he not go up unto the feast, but when all are pressing to Jerusalem, because it's Passover, you go to Jerusalem on Passover, goeth himself into Galilee. That's the wrong direction. And not himself alone, but he takes his disciples with him and proceeds thence to Capernaum. If you know the geography, Capernaum is he's heading northeast. Jerusalem is southwest. So what's the reason he's going the wrong direction and he's leading a bunch of people in the wrong direction? And here's his answer of John Chrysostom, because henceforth he was quietly annulling the Torah taking occasion from the wickedness of the Jew. <sighs> and this is what you end up with, with John 6, 4, which really doesn't make a lot of sense. He's going, you know, there's this great movie from the 80s, one of my favorite movies. It's a movie with John Candy. I forget what it's called, but he's driving on a divided highway going the wrong, on the wrong direction. And they're going down and somebody shouts at them out the window, you're going the wrong way. And he turns to his friend and he says, how do they know where we're going? <laughs> But Yeshua is going the wrong way. He's heading north instead of Jerusalem for the pilgrimage. It doesn't and, and make the Capernaum sense. synagogue is filled with people, too, Right. when the he gets synag there. The synagogue is filled with people. There's 5,000 people it describes. Where are they doing out in the countryside? They should all be heading to Jerusalem, not you know, uh, standing around without provisions. Right? If they're heading to Jerusalem, then they should have uh, food with them for the way. Instead, he's got to feed them because they were just out for an afternoon. Right? They, they just came to hear him teach. So something doesn't fit. And, 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 and this is important. Michael's not the first one to come up with this. Oh, and, and not only does it not fit, this is a, this is a problem for all Christians. Uh, this isn't just a problem if you have a one-year ministry. It's not just a problem if you believe you should obey the Torah. This is a problem for all Christians. Right. Even if you believe the Torah was done away at the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua, we, many Christians I've talked to, and there are a few that believe that Yeshua went around purposely violating the Torah, but they're, they're a minority. Most Christians understand that Yeshua had to be the lamb without blemish. He could not be a transgressor of the Torah and be sacrificed as a perfect sacrifice. So here we have a gospel account. If John 6, 4 is, is in the gospel text, we have Yeshua not only uh, disobeying the command of Passover, but taking others with him and in, in participating in uh, a large group of people who are not participating in Passover. A couple days later, he's in the synagogue teaching to people who are not at Passover. You have this whole problem 
of an entire Passover is being disregarded and Yeshua is at the center of it. 